So let's open in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for gathering us here today. We thank you for your word of both law and gospel. We thank you that you have called us to live in the light of your gospel. We ask that you would lead us in this time of study in understanding our neighbors better and understanding how we can better uh, proclaim your truth and your word and salvation in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, use this time of study to know you better and to open our hearts more and more to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to tell you right now, I know I talk fast, and now I feel like we're under pressure, so I'm going to talk even faster. So, um, sorry. So what you're being handed right now, which I can make copies of um, more because I <laughs> I am a horrible estimator, and I thought, yeah, I think about 40. <laughs> I think you're more than 40, <laughs> so forgive me for my bad estimating skills. Um, so we started with Judaism last week. Um, right now, we're, we're looking at different, um, different faiths around the world, major, major world religions, and with Christianity, we have an exclusivity claim that is not well appreciated by a lot of others. Um, does that mean that it is any less true? No. No. And when we look at these other religions, we see that there are exclusivities built in or in other religions. But for some reason, the Christian faith is attacked for having exclusively um, one way to the Father, which is interesting because it is also the most inclusive, right? That, that all who hear the gospel, and, and God wants all to hear the gospel. So, um, so when we proclaim that word, um, we are planting those seeds. We know that God will do the growing, but we are planting and we are watering those seeds of faith and um, and it's not, it's not uh, only for a select few, right? Um, so there is this exclusively inclusive um, beauty to, or inclusively exclusive beauty to our, our faith. So we started with Judaism. And as I said, I thought that would be the easy one to start with. Mm, wrong. Um, there's so much. And go back and look at the, the stuff. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to rerun over that totally, um, but uh, in your hands, you'll see that we have um, the 13 principles of faith, which is very interesting because these are affirmed weekly by the observant Jewish people. So when, when an observant Jewish person goes to synagogue, this is spoken, or actually it's sung at every single um, prayer time, synagogue time of meeting. And it's very similar to how every single week we have our creed and we say our creed. And it is something that I believe, I believe, I believe. Every single one of these statements starts with I believe. And, um, and a lot of these principles are, of faith are really great, um, great ways to, to connect our faith, to connect the Jewish faith with the Christian faith. We can, we can find a lot of connecting points in those. Um, and then we also, doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doo. okay, yep, um, nope, I'm jumping ahead. All right, there was a question last week, and I will say, um, as I was going through to answer these questions that I wrote down, I, I looked at my writing and I went, Whoa, I have no idea what's meant by this. My shorthand apparently is too short. Um, so, uh, so I'm hoping that I can answer these questions. And if I've missed the question somehow, just bring it back to me and I will do better. Um, also, I do wanna, do wanna stress again how what we're learning about the Jewish faith, about today we're gonna talk about Islam, it's very generalized. There is so much in these world religions, um, just like it would be difficult 
to get into the full nitty gritty. I mean, we're still learning the full nitty gritty within our faith, right? So it's the same thing. This is all very cursory. Um, it's not that it's not the same story for every single Jewish or Islamic person we meet, right? Just like as Christians, we all have our own stories and journeys of faith. So um, one of the questions that came up last week was if about conversion into Judaism, right? Like, can you convert? Because they don't really have evangelists like Christians do. There are, there is one group I found, there is one group, um, I believe it's the Reform Jewish group, I think that's right, that, um, that does have a little bit of an evangelistic approach to it. So one can convert to Judaism. The most common convert is one who is marrying into a family, a Jewish family. Um, or, and this one was really interesting to me, someone who is seeking a deeper religious life. And I thought that that was interesting because they are seeking a deeper religious life and they seek it by, and in their conversion, they are saying, I will take upon myself the burden of the law. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because... Um, as people, we want to have something to do. We are task people. Even for non-task oriented people, we are still task people. We want to do something. We want to feel like we're moving forward and that we're productive. And so if we take the burden of the law upon ourselves, we're doing something. We're charged with doing something and it feels like maybe I'm having a deeper religious or more intentional religious experience because I have to do and live up to all this. Instead of living intentionally in the freedom that we have in Christ, we can have a deeply religious experience and life as a Christian people by really leaning into and walking in the freedom that we have in our salvation in Christ. Another question that was brought up was how can we reconcile the Jews um, being God's chosen people and Jesus being the way to the Father. And remember, Jesus was talking to Thomas when he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was Jewish, speaking to a Jewish man. So he is telling this Jewish man, you go to the Father through me, okay? So um, there is a misconception that we don't need to witness to Jewish people because they're God's chosen people and they have their own way to the Father. You know, we have Jesus as our Messiah. They have Abraham as their guide, their teacher, that there are these two covenants and that, um, that the Jewish people have the covenant through Abraham and that's their way. And it's sad, a lot of Christians, and there's a strong movement within some of the Christian denominations that, um, that we should support Israel, but, and not that we don't support Israel, but, but with the intent that that will lead us to the end times. And so these Christians will support Israel with their words, with their money, but it's really going towards supporting something called dispensational, dispensational premillennialism. There you go, done. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, we will get into that in, um, in one of the academy classes. It, it goes back to the teaching of the literal, um, the literal telling of the end times, reading Revelation as a linear timeline instead of how it is written, which is very spiral with, with heightened language. So we're not studying Revelation today, but, um, but that's, that's where it comes from. Um, it's not biblical. It's not a good reading of scripture. 
Um, basically, the bottom line of it is that the Jewish people will experience this great religious rebirth. They'll rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, which sparks a bunch of cataclysmic events um, that end in the Battle of Armageddon, and then um, and that then the Jewish people will finally accept Jesus as their savior. And then, then Jesus can return in glory and, um, and God's kingdom, which is a thousand year reign of peace, would begin in Jerusalem. So that's kind of a nutshell. Um, but I thought it was really interesting, the author of the book, um, or of the section of the book that I was reading from, The Christian Difference, um, they, uh, he said that, that, that these these Christians who are supporting Israel with money but withholding the gospel, they are engaging in theological anti-Semitism. And I thought that was really interesting that he was, he was really saying that even though they are supporting Israel, they are not being kind to the Jewish people because they're supporting it with um, selfish means of bringing about the end times. And, um, and they're withholding the gospel. They're withholding the truth of salvation in Christ. Um, so, uh, do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Um, so Israel, the Jewish people were, um, were God's chosen people. They were set apart. Um, but over and over again, we see how Yahweh hardens their hearts, or their hearts are hardened, their, their eyes are closed to his promises. And the prophecies tell of a restoration that would come, and that the full promise would be open to and, and heard and accepted and lived into by a foreign people. And Paul, in, um, in Romans, he writes uh, about his own anguish, and the loss of Israel. Um, and he also says that, that, that the gospel came first to the Jews, but they rejected it. And then it was taken to the Gentiles, or to the Greek, the Gentiles, who would then bring it back to the Jewish people. So this is part of why we are called to continue to share the gospel with them. Um, boo, 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 let's see here. Uh, if you remember Jesus' lament over Jerusalem, where he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and he, he wishes to gather them as a chicken gathers her brood. Um, he mourned over the lost children of Israel as well. So it, being chosen or G, being a chosen people of God, um, they were pulled to be a separate people. The Gentiles, through Christ, were brought into the fold. And so Israel, the church, um, you know, we'll often refer to it as the new Israel. It is, it is the full church. There is no difference of Gentile Jew when we are in Christ. Paul writes about that as well. So now we're going to get to the, just a couple of the readings that we have, and then we're going to move on to Islam, because that's what we're studying today. So... <laughs> Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon um, of the early 20th century wrote this comprehensive code of Jewish law and Jewish ph philosophy. This is the three. This is where the three principles of faith come in, um, and those are used as we use our creed. Um, and then the Talmud, uh, which contains the Mishnah, which is the Oral Torah and its interpretation that offers God's 13 attributes of mercy. And that's the second page, um, or the back of the page, which we know that God is a merciful God who forgives, as it says right in these attributes of mercy. He's also a just God who, who demands a penalty for sin. So when we are speaking with our Jewish brother or sister, any discussion that comes up of sin or repentance or forgiveness really needs to include that need for intercession. And God himself interceded on our behalf through 
the second person of the Trinity interceding um, and taking upon himself the just wrath, the just penalty, so that in his mercy we can have forgiveness. So we have a lot of really great connecting points when we talk to our Jewish neighbors. Um, also, as I'm thinking about this, um, the Everyone His Witness workshop that, that we do three times a year, the Everyone His Witness workshop um, has contextual models where you can go back and you can have direct um, how to have these conversations with my Jewish neighbor, with my Islamic neighbor, with my um, uh, Mormon neighbor, with my Hindu neighbor. They have these context modules so that, um, that you can go in and, and dig into this deeper and have someone walk with you or guide you um, or have a group, you know, where you can learn how to do that better. Okay, so now we're going to move into Islam. Um, just a quick background, and remember, this is, this is very cursory, very generalized. We're taking a very high, high view on, on Islam as a whole. Um, it's a religion, it's a culture, it's a per personal faith, and it's a political system. It began in 610, when Muhammad was contemplating the polytheistic Meccan, so Meccan society, and it is told that he began receiving revelations from an angel sent by Allah, and that angel was Gabriel. In 622, Muhammad and a little over 100 of his followers moved to Medina, and they established the first Islamic community state. After this, after they moved, um, Muhammad had another revelation from Allah that he should organize and establish an order that consecrated him as a prophet and messenger um, of Allah and that he would be the ruler and that um, all those, this is what he was, was revealed to him. Can you imagine being revealed that you should, you know, have everyone follow you? <laughs> and that you are, you are God's own, own messenger um, and that what, which we are God's messengers, but anyway. Okay, and that, um, that all of Muhammad's followers should put their brotherhood of faith and loyalty to Muhammad above all. Now, there's a difference. We don't proclaim that anyone um, is our follower, certainly, and that no one um, puts their faith and loyalty in us, and certainly not above all. Um, then he received another revelation that he should fight back against injustices that pagan Meccans had perpetuated against his followers, and this revelation we know as jihad. So in the early time of Muhammad's rule, there was actually a large Jewish population that they were allies, that the, the Muslim and the Jewish people, they were allies. And then the Jewish people were accused of conspiring against Muhammad and his followers um, with his enemies. So in 628, Muhammad led a group to destroy the largest Jewish community in Arabia. They beheaded the Jewish men, and they enslaved the Jewish women and children. And Muhammad died in 632. See, I told you, it was very overview, very overview. So with the Islamic faith, there are six articles of faith. Um, the first is the most important doctrine of Islam, and that is that there is one God. One God named Allah. So we have one God, Allah. That's the, the number one doctrine. Um, it's Arabic for the God. And a Muslim must confess Muhammad as the final prophet, prophet, which is known as the seal of Allah's prophets, as he is called in the Quran. So in the holy book of Islam, they have the Quran and um, and Muhammad is named as the seal, as the final prophet of Allah. Number two, every Muslim should believe in Allah's angels. 
In Islam, angels are messengers who serve Allah and relay communication from him. The Quran mentions angels such as Gabriel and Michael. Other angels are in charge of recording man's good and bad deeds and torturing dead people in the grave. Another angel named Is Israfel will blow the trumpet on doomsday, announcing the end of times, the resurrection of the dead, and the day of reckoning. Something I want to note, as we're going through this tenets of faith, you'll hear a lot of very familiar words um, that, and terms and ideas that we have in our Christian faith, which do not let that lead you down the path of, we have so much that's the same. So really, it makes sense that we're all worshiping the same God. We're all ending up in the same place because that is not true. We may have some similar words. It does not mean that those words have the same or similar meanings. So the third tenet of faith is that every Muslim should believe in the books of Allah, especially the Quran. Islam also calls upon Muslims to believe in the books of the Bible, the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels. But Islamic religious authorities widely teach that the Bible was corrupted by rabbis and bishops, so the, div the final divine message to humanity is Islam. So our Muslim brothers and sisters won't necessarily say there's no validity to the Bible, but they'll say it is corrupted. It's not the final word. It's very interesting. I, um, I met a woman who was Christian and she converted to Islam when she got married because her husband was Muslim. And she said, it's pretty much like Christianity. It's just no Jesus. I will admit, I thought it was interesting. I was young, and so I just kind of went, okay. Now I kind of go, huh? I would love to have a conversation with her again. It was just fascinating. So the fourth, um, the fourth tenet, in addition to the belief in Muhammad as the seal of the prophets, Islam preaches the belief in the prophets of Allah. That includes most biblical prophets and patriarchs, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, are believed to be the best of prophets in rank after Muhammad. So each of those patriarchs or prophets, including Jesus as a prophet, um, they all lead to Muhammad, and they are less than Muhammad in rank. Number five, the belief in the day of judgment or the afterlife is very important. They believe that for both the Muslim and the infidel, the afterlife reckoning starts with the grave. Islam teaches there will be a day of resurrection followed by the judgment that all humans will be divided between eternal destinations of paradise and hell. So we hear this, we say, okay, that's a, that's a connecting point because we believe in the afterlife. We believe in judgment. We believe that, that there is paradise and Hades. There is heaven and hell, which will be the abode of all non-Muslims and hypocrites. Hell will be where all non-Muslims and hypocrites live with no exceptions. Both the hellfire and paradise are divided into levels of torture or pleasure based on what people deserve for their deeds. In Islam, paradise is a sensual place of extravagant food and sexual pleasures, especially for male Muslims who get a number of virgins according to their deeds. While prophets and saints, pipe down, while prophets and saints <laughs> go directly to paradise after day of judgment, the Quran specifies that martyrs will go to, be, to, to go to be with Allah as soon as they die in a jihad. So this is where um, if you are martyred, if you give your life for jihad, for the cause, then you don't have that waiting period for the day of judgment. You go immediately to be with Allah. 
Other Muslims may be liable to torture in the grave or in a purgatory in order to measure up for the rewards of paradise. The sixth tenant, Muslims believe in predestination. Islam teaches that Allah foreknows and foreordains all the events in the lives of individuals. So this can lead to fatalism in the lives of Muslims. However, Islamic scholars have struggled for centuries with how this predestination um, reflects on Allah's justice and um, that the Quran has described in many verses. So note, they do have paradise, they do have a heaven, but it's filled with sensual and self-serving pleasures. Whereas in Christianity, we know heaven is a glorified new inheritance that we receive, that we participate with the marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. So it's not self-serving. And we know that it is good, but we don't have a lot of details of what life will be in heaven eternally. But what God tells us and what is revealed in scripture is good. It is good. It is in the full presence and full communion with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so, hold on a second here. I, I might be missing a page. Hold on. Oh my goodness. I think I'm missing a page. Okay. Well, so if we're missing a page, we're missing a page. Nope, I'm not. Okay. Oh, no, nope, we're good. Sorry. I am so sorry. Oh my gosh. Not, I can't wing it with Islam. <laughs> I'm not, I can't. So, um, so then we have this is Islamic creed. So we have these tenets of faith that each Muslim follows. And I think it's very interesting as we go through this, both with Judaism and Islam, we find that there is a heavy, heavy emphasis on law. And I think if you were already in service today, you'll find great appreciation for this after hearing the sermon. And if you have yet to go to service, you'll see a lot of really amazing connection and connecting points within that. The Islamic creed that if you were to, um, to convert to Muslim, you would have to say, I testify there is no God but Allah and Muhammad his messenger. This is called al-shahadatan in Arabic, which means the two testimonies. Allah alone has the right to be worshipped, having neither partner nor son. Allah is not a trinity, and a Muslim is bound to obey commandments of Muhammad and acknowledge the Quran as the final message from Allah. Then you have ritual prayer, and this is performed five times a day. Muslims gain more spiritual rewards. Remember that the afterlife, Allah has angels who are tallying your good deeds and your bad deeds. And so when you are praying in a group or ideally at mosque, you are gaining more points. But if you are Muslim, you are allowed to pray anywhere, wherever you are. They are performed at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset, and night, and skipping any of them is a grave sin. Lots of bad, bad marks. The prayers take a few minutes um, unless the prayer wants to recite from the Quran um, any verses uh, or stories. So originally, the Muslims would pray toward Jerusalem, which is interesting, and then, um, and then the Quran commanded that Muhammad and his followers pray turned toward Mecca. Um, zakat, this is another important point in Islam, zakat is often translated as almsgiving, Almsgiving is part of it, but the original meaning, meaning of that is purification. So again, in Judaism, we have a lot of purification rituals. In Islam, we have purification rituals as well. 
The Quran speaks about these um, zakat funds being used for more than helping the poor. They can help the poor and the needy. They can help the officials who are called um, to be appointed over them. Um, they, can, uh, they can use those alms or the zakat to rescue or free um, those who are in debt. Uh, it's an ordinance from Allah and they trust this because Allah is all wise and all knowing. So um, fasting is another important part. Fasting during Ramadan. Ramadan is a month long festival um, or holy season. Um, fasting happens from sun up until sundown. Everyone is to abstain from food, drink, smoking, and sexual relations. And it's a, a way of self-purification. So if a Muslim breaks the daytime fast without an excuse, he has to take up for that grave sin um, 60 days of fat, fasting, so 60 more days of fasting, or um, feeding 60 poor people. And in Muslim governments, um, this is very interesting, if we were to live in a Muslim government rule, as non-Muslims, we would still have to follow the Ramadan fasting. And anyone who breaks that daytime fast during Ramadan, um, whether Muslim or not, has to fast for 60 days or feed 60 um, 60 poor people. So there's a punishment for both Muslims and non-Muslims who publicly break that daytime fast. Another need is a pilgrimage to Mecca, to the Holy Land. And this is um, a Hajj. Hajj. Um, so this is an obligation that every Muslim should undertake and do if they have the money to do it. It really, or if they are physically able to do it, even more importantly. Um, but it's, it's an obligation. It's an expectation at least once in the Muslim's life they will go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. The annual ritual is, um, is performed in the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. And so everyone gathers at Mecca at one time each year. And there are millions of people there. Um, the, there's a shrine called the Kaaba. And it's a cubicle building covered with a black cloth embroidered with golden Arabic calligraphy. And the Quran claims that the Kaaba is the place of worship that God commanded Abraham and his son Ishmael to build. We'll get to Abraham. So um, five-day rituals of the Hajj. So when they go to, to, to Mecca, um, they circle the Kaaba. So they circle this, this place of worship seven times. They stand together on Mount Arafat asking God for what they wish and for his forgiveness. And then they throw small pebbles at three large stone walls called Jamarat, which symbolizes stoning the devil that tempted Abraham to defy Allah. And then they slaughter an animal, usually a sheep, to follow the example of Abraham who slaughtered a ram instead of his son. And the meat is then given to the poor and needy. Okay, so we hear again, a lot of really familiar, familiar names. We know the name Abraham. We know the name Ishmael. We don't understand Ishmael or Abraham the same as the Muslim. So we're going to talk about Abraham because Abraham is a very much contested figure because he holds a lot of significance in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. Judaism and Christianity follow the lineage of Abraham to Isaac, right? Or we come from that lineage from Isaac. Whereas Islam follows the lineage from Ishmael. 
So it's very interesting when reading the story of Abraham, you know, he was given that covenantal promise by God that he would have an heir. He would have a son, that Sarah would bear a son and that his ans or his, um, his not ancestors, uh, his offspring, thank you. His offspring would, would be more numerous than the stars, right? So, so he is promised, um, promised this and he believes it and it is credited to him as righteousness um, through faith. So, um, so Sarah is not getting pregnant, is not getting pregnant, is not getting pregnant. And so she says, here, take Hagar, my maidservant, and have a baby with her. That's how we're going to get an heir. That's how you're going to get an heir. Well, he gets an heir, and it's Ishmael. And so, um, so then Sarah, of course, which I don't know, you know this story, or you might not know this story. It's worth going back and listening, or walk, reading. Um, okay, we're going to take a breath. Um, worth going back. It's, it's so fascinating. But Sarah then is irritated because jealous. now jealous. Yeah. That's where that works too. And so she takes it out on Hagar that Hagar has bore Abraham a son. And so Hagar leaves and, and there is a blessing over Ishmael. That is where the line of Islam comes from, Ishmael. Um, the Quran separates Abraham from Christianity and Judaism by stating that Abraham is really the first Muslim, that he is a Muslim man. And so when Muslims pray, they are supposed to mention both the name of Abraham and pray for Allah's blessings on him, or else all of those ritual prayers are annulled. So again, even in promises, there is just law, 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 right? It just weighs heavy. In the Jewish faith, Abraham is a patriarch, he is a father. In Christianity, we know that he is a man who is saved by faith in the coming Messiah of Jesus Christ. We read that in Romans 4, 3, where Paul writes about that. In Islam, Abraham is an example of perfect morality and obedience to Allah. The Muslims scholars, they, they deny that any wrongdoing was done by Abraham because the Islamic prophets must be infallible. So Abraham did nothing wrong. He was perfect um, because he had to be. So then there's Jesus. And in Muslim, in the Islamic religion, they do have Jesus. He is understood to be a prophet and a messenger of Allah. He was sent to guide the children of Israel with a new revelation. He is amongst the top five prophets in Islam. So he does, I mean, they do say he was a prophet. Um, they also teach that he was Muslim because he would have to be Muslim if he was a prophet of Allah. And he preached and he worshiped Allah. His miracles, he did do miracles. They were done in the name of Allah and other prophets did miracles of equal measure. So Jesus is one of the many prophets. His miracles, um, or I'm sorry, the, the Quran rejects the divinity of Jesus that he was neither God incarnate nor the son of God. They absolutely reject that. His death and resurrection are also rejected. The Quran states that there was a stand-in, that who was crucified on the cross was a look-alike to Jesus, and that he instead was taken up by Allah himself to be with Allah. So Jesus never died, but as a prophet, he was taken up to be with Allah. And then on the day of judgment, even Jesus rejects the people, but it is Muhammad who will be the intercessor. Muhammad will be the intercessor for the people. So, what are some good connecting points for us? The first thing to know is that when we are speaking with our Muslim brothers and sisters, we do not start with saying, what's up with this Muhammad guy? Right? Because that is... That's offensive. It's offensive. 
Um, and, and it's not the way to go. We don't want to offend someone from the start. Instead, there is a lot within Islam that will bear witness or that does bear witness to Jesus. They do believe that there was a virgin birth. They do believe that he did perform miracles. They do believe that he is sent from Allah. Let's not go there yet, right? But they do believe that he is sent. They do believe that he was sinless. So we have a lot of really nice connecting points. Don't try to connect it through the Quran, though because we have one revelation of salvation, and that is God's word of Holy Scripture. That is the Bible. The Quran cannot teach us or tell us the story of salvation because it is not God's performative and active and transforming word. Scripture alone does that. In Islam, Paradise is reward for following the law. It's reward for good deeds that outweigh the bad. So again, here, that law-gospel distinction is absolutely key. I am having issues. Um, really, really key. Uh, Romans 3.20 is, um, is great for that, that, that no one is righteous under the law. James 2.10, same thing. The law and condemnation, when we are sharing with our brothers and sisters of the Muslim faith, we can really, really go with that law, right? Because no one stands under the law. We all crumble. We all crumble in our own unfaithfulness, in our own unworthiness, our own imperfection. But when we have that discussion of law, it leads us into the promise and the discussion of gospel and the good news. And so we can share without going with Muhammad, without going um, into, uh, into the Quran, but we have some connecting points already built in. God in his grace and mercy, even when there are cultures or religions that, that take astray, he builds in connecting points because God's love is for all. He wants all to turn to him. And so he provides us with those connecting points. So um, that's Judaism and Islam in a nutshell. Um, next week, I believe we're turning to Hinduism um, and we will... We're just doing Hinduism. If you have any questions about Judaism, further questions, or about Islam, let me know. I will do my best to dive into those and do a quick overview or answer of those. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll just keep going. And by the end of it, we will address the exclusive exclusivity claim. Okay? So, all right. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.